Welcome to the Skift Podcast, weekly conversations on global travel trend lines. It's an annual tradition here at Skift. The editorial staff gets together to talk and talk and talk about what we see as the biggest emerging travel industry trends for the coming year. We call these our mega trends because they're just that big. And this year we have 12 in our annual magazine. It's available to download at skift.com slash megatrends 2019. And we like to introduce them to the world by highlighting a handful of these travel trends in front of a crowd. This year, we're doing that in 10 cities around the world. The first took place in mid-January in New York City, and we recorded that event for you. So on today's episode of the Skift Podcast, you'll hear us talk about the megatrends defining travel in 2019. Some of those trends include brands giving more control to consumers, the appeal of under-tourism, the way lines are being blurred in hospitality, the rise of wellness marketing in travel, and Google's domination of local discovery. We had a lineup of Skift All-Stars presenting, travel tech editor Sean O'Neill, research director Heisha Wong, senior editor Andrew Shavakman, senior hospitality editor Deanna Ting, executive editor Dennis Shaw, co-founder and chief product officer Jason Clampett, founder and CEO Rafa Ali, and your podcast host, that's me, Hannah Sampson. And now to the megatrends. Sean O'Neill kicks things off. So 2019, what do you need to know? Um, the bigger picture issue that uh, Skift will be tracking this year will be the settling down of some gains that the travel industry made last year. Um, on the one hand, geopolitical tensions loom large. On the other, the demand for travel is surging in many parts of the world, and there's a recovery of tourism in many other parts. And so we think one of the most fascinating tensions this year will be with this, this upheaval on the one hand and the surge in travel on the other. We'll be also tracking uh, the backlash against big tech. Now, in 2018, 2018 was the year of a you know, a backlash against tech. Uh, at the beginning of last year, Skift called it, just saying. Um, and this year we're wondering what's going to happen with the big platform companies. Are they going to clean up the mess that they have created with their hyper-addictive apps, um, the digital harassment, the fake news blight? Um, we'll also be looking at emerging destinations um, and how they are coping with over-tourism and trying to balance that with a, a desire for meaningful growth. Um, over-tourism happens to be a term that we coin, it's now part of the lexicon, we're very proud of that. Um, another thing we'll be tracking is the low-cost carriers uh, and how they'll be running into headwinds as the main airline groups, uh, finally after many years, the traditional carriers uh, get their act together and having a competitive strategy. We'll be uh, looking at the online booking companies, uh, online booking companies. Um, uh, they are struggling to figure out the next phase of growth. Uh, they're going to scramble to get there. In some ways, they're going to fall. In other ways, they're going to succeed, and we're going to be watching it very closely. Um, we'll be looking at loyalty and how the travel industry is going to try to use loyalty beyond airline miles and hotel points to um, engage more directly and build relationships with their customers. This year will be an inflection point on that. Um, and we'll also be looking at labor issues, including labor shortages that are particularly plaguing hospitality. Um, you'll hear later tonight some clever uh, techniques that hotel companies have had in order to try to solve that problem. Um, so this year, once again, Skift will serve in its role as a watchdog and an innovator in the industry as we grow. Um, all of the trends that you hear presented here tonight by my colleagues are uh, part of a longer narrative arc that we have created. Um, we're very eager to hear your feedback afterward about the presentations tonight. Um, and if any of you would like to have uh, us come to help your company or your colleagues or your team members find out how these megatrends might impact you, uh, please reach out to us. So the backdrop for all of the megatrends you're going to hear tonight is the economy. Um, and Skift Research has been watching this closely. They've been dropping the knowledge. Uh, and we're going to have now uh, some insights from the uh, senior director of research at Skift, Heisha Wang. 
Thank you, Sean. Good evening. Uh, my name is Heisha Wang. I'm head of Scripture Research. So despite all the craziness, 2018 turned out to be a very healthy year for both the global economy at large and the travel industry specifically. So will this hold for 2019? We believe the fundamentals remain strong for another year of healthy growth. At a macro level, the advanced economies should remain stable and the emerging markets should continue to post a stronger growth. Next slide, please, Tom. Delving into travel sectors, public hotel brands are expecting steady as she goes growth for 2019, and cruise lines are noting strong 2019 bookings for occupancy and rate. Airlines should benefit from passenger volume growth and increased ancillary sales though low-cost competition and uh, oil prices are still a wild card. The secular switch to e-commerce worldwide should continue to become um, tailwind for online booking sites. The leading global online travel agencies are likely to further pursue full-service platform strategies as competition intensifies. However, we shouldn't downplay the potential impact of the current political uncertainty and market volatility. If continued, they could create a whirlpool of challenges. Now, megatrends. Please welcome Andrew to present our first megatrend of the evening. Thanks, Heisha. I'm Andrew, senior editor. I cover meetings, corporate travel, and a bunch of other stuff. I'm supposed to remind you, if you are tweeting about this and we say something smart or dumb, hopefully smart, use hashtags, gift megatrends, um, and then we'll probably retweet it or something, because that's what we do. So our first megatrend is brands give travelers more control over their experience. So creation is the new consumption. As travelers tired of commodity travel, are taking an active role in curating their experiences. Advanced digital platforms are giving them new and better ways to make that happen and facilitate creativity in the discovery process. Slide, Tom. So here's some data for you guys. This is from a Skift research report on how travelers in the US use mobile when they're on the road. And as you can see, air travel, hotel, navigation, um, along with ride sharing are used pretty heavily. But, um, you know, tours and activities booking and sort of mobile payments aren't really used. So across the different sectors of travel, we're seeing some interesting things. Airlines have been deconstructing their fares and unfortunately selling them back to us. So, uh, I mean, the bottom line is that in a sick way, this gives travelers more choice about exactly what they want. And we should expect to see more airlines um, sort of experiment with lounge access, different perks, um, things that actually have a tangible uh, impact on the travel experience that travelers can choose from. On the hotel front, uh, we're seeing hotels in terms of their e-commerce getting more sophisticated in actually selling specific room types to travelers and actually having good data on like what's actually in that room, allowing travelers to make the choice. We're also seeing, in terms of concepts, hotel brands sort of experiment with bridging the divide with home shares and creating new, interesting new concepts. It's still kind of a work in progress, but the bottom line is the big hotel brands realize that travelers want more choice. Uh, on the online booking front, TripAdvisor has been up to something interesting. They've gone full Pinterest, and their homepage is now kind of a social network where you can save trip ideas or suggestions from influencers or bloggers or whatever and go back to them when you want to book. This makes a lot of sense for TripAdvisor because they're known for online reviews and they're used in destination a lot, but they want to take sort of a bigger piece of the overall puzzle when it comes to how travelers shop around and get inspired. Um, in terms of tours and experiences, there's a lot going on. We're in the midst of a big upheaval. A lot of the product around the world is being brought online through a variety of companies. And while you might think, oh, I'm 
booking a commodity tour through Viator, you're soon going to have a lot more options of what you can book. Airbnb is doing some interesting stuff with this. They have their experiences product, and they also have integrated it into sort of an itinerary management system that sits in their app on their site after you make a booking that recommends not just their own products, which it does, but uh, tourist attractions, um, restaurants, whatever that might be near where you're staying. So it's sort of creating a canvas to give travelers choice instead of saying, you have to buy this from us. So we don't know how this is going to play out in the end, um, but empowering travelers to choose instead of pushing them stuff that they don't want and they're going to ignore is the next wave in travel. And since travelers are already using the tools they want to book, um, now that they've tasted power, they really want more choice. Um, so with that, I give you Hannah Sampson. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, everyone. So you can, you can tweet this part if you're tweeting. Um, under tourism is the new over tourism. That is our, uh, our next mega trend. And we really like the sound of that because it sounds cool and it's easy to say. But we want to point out that we don't mean that under tourism is like a big problem to solve like over tourism. We mean it's kind of a buzzy new term and idea that... Um, that destinations are trying to use to market themselves as peaceful but exciting alternatives. Uh, we've seen this play out in Oslo, Norway, where tourism officials there found some, um, they rescued a pair of tourists from Paris, which we should all be, you know, rescued when we're in Paris, I guess. Um, they brought them to the Norwegian capital to enjoy a vacation without the crowds um, in the Louvre and, um, and at parks, basically, they got a lot of free press out of that little rescue. Um, Puerto Rico, which has spent much of the last year recovering from Hurricane Maria, is also working to position itself as a destination for U.S. travelers um, as an alternative to packed Caribbean islands where U.S. travelers can come and have a more meaningful experience. Um, and uh, now it's been named to number one spot on the New York Times, uh, 52 places to go, so it might not be under-touristed for long. Go while you can. We're also seeing tour operators create um, experiences in popular destinations away from the bucket list places. So if you want to go to Italy, maybe there's a tour operator who can take you to the places that are not full and overflowing with tourists. Um, we saw Intrepid Travel put together what they call a not hot list that, uh, for 2019 that offers alternatives to places like Everest and Osaka and Borneo. Just for some context, in 2017, global tourism arrivals reached 1.3 billion, according to the UN World Tourism Organization. And that's a 7% increase year over year. Um, the number of tourism arrivals have gone up every year since the recession. And it was really the recession that caused some governments to turn to tourism to try to help uh, boost their economies. At the same time, low-cost carriers and Airbnb emerged as ways to make travel internationally more accessible um, and affordable. But that's become a double-edged sword, as you'll see on this next slide. Um, destinations like Barcelona and Venice and Amsterdam have really faced a significant tourism backlash and they've been forced to put measures into place that um, try to combat some of the impact, forced us to coin the term over tourism. Um, so we see Venice implementing a day trip fee and Amsterdam adding a tax for cruise ship passengers. It's actually working in um, Amsterdam's case because some ships are not coming. We'll see if they're happy with the fact that that's working or if that's um, another double-edged sword. We're also really interested in um, over on your left in this push to get travelers to stop geotagging photos. Um, basically, like, take your Instagram picture, but don't reveal exactly where it is. This was a, a photo from an Instagram story by an Arizona hiking guide. Um, and it just urges people to consider the size of their audience. Are you an influencer with 2 million followers? Um, can a location handle that kind of traffic? Uh, what are the resources in place to support more visitors? So as over-tourism continues to demand attention and solutions, offbeat destinations or those with new stories have a real opportunity to market immersive experiences that build relationships with people, places, culture, and community over those Instagram-worthy photo ops and mass tourism. And for our next trend, our hospitality trend, we have Deanna Ting, who knows everything about hospitality. 
Thanks, Donna. Um, I definitely don't know everything about hospitality, but I appreciate that introduction. Um, so for our next mega trend, I want you to sort of envision yourself as a traveler who's looking for a place to stay. So there might be a variety of different reasons why you're traveling or with whom you might be traveling. Um, you might be traveling for work. You might be traveling with your family, with your boo, um, a group of friends. The possibilities are endless, right? But chances are, depending on the trip type or purpose that you have, you'll want different types of accommodations, right? It's pretty common sense. So groups and families probably might gravitate towards short-term rentals or extended stay products. Um, Road-weary executive might prefer the comfort of a classic hotel that has really strong Wi-Fi but even stronger coffee in the mornings. And so the truth is that you know, we as travelers, when we think of ourselves as just travelers, not as people who work in the travel industry, um, we've always known that different types of accommodations are better suited to our specific needs for whatever trip we're taking. But consumers in general, like removing ourselves from that and looking at consumers, we know that they don't classify or refer to these places where they stay in the same way that we as an industry do. You know, they're not saying to themselves, you know, I'm really looking for that upper upscale boutique hotel or a postal or an urban short-term rental or a glamping suite, um, nor do they care. Today, the hospitality industry is finally realizing that every single trip, every single individual traveler, is, he, he or she represents a unique demand segment. And the choices for consumers now are nearly endless. And while we as an industry like to use those categories, we really love like saying, oh, this is mid-scale, this is economy, this is upper upscale, this is upscale, this is luxury, um, consumers really generally don't. Um, and even as an industry, we are starting to blend and mix and blur all those categories together. Um, I can think of no better example of this than um, the fact that traditional hotel companies are now entering the not-so-alternative accommodation space. And private accommodations companies and platforms like Airbnb are also getting more into the hotel space, encouraging hotels to actually list on their platform or even developing products of their own that are very hotel-like. So if we look at our next slide, um, you can see, you know, last year, now this information is not updated because Airbnb does not like to give very updated information, but as of February 2018, they noted that they had approximately 24,000 hotels on their platform, actual hotels. Um, last year as well, Marriott added a total of 340 homes, actual homes, um, through its pilot with a company called Hostmaker, where they offer short-term rentals um, as part of tribute portfolio homes. Now, Wyndham, which has traditionally been in the vacation rental space for quite some time, has nearly 10,000 properties worldwide to choose from that are not traditional hotel products. And uh, Paris-based Accor Hotels now also has more than 10,000 listings available through its One Fine Stay rental brand. Um, and since 2016, it has bought or invested in at least seven different companies that have absolutely nothing to do with traditional hotels. So the truth is that hotel companies don't just offer hotels anymore, and alternative accommodations aren't really alternative anymore. The industry as a whole can't limit itself to a set of defined categories or silos anymore. So this convergence is really impacting how and what hospitality companies sell and market to consumers. So in short, hotels don't just sell rooms. Hotels sell an experience, and that experience is increasingly being determined by a set of specific wants or attributes, as my colleague Andrew alluded to earlier. So just as all travel brands realize that they need to give travelers more control, more co-creation of their experiences, hospitality companies are doing just that today, even as everything in the sector is beginning to blur. And for our next Megatron, I'd like to introduce Dennis Shaw. Thanks, Deanna. Uh, this is our labor megatrend. Labor shortages force a wake-up call for travel brands to treat workers better. Next slide. Now, I am not a big fat zero, 
But up here is a big fat zero. And it's an important number because that's the number of job applicants that showed up when a Homewood Suites was opening up last year uh, right outside of Salt Lake City. They were advertising for housekeepers and none showed up. Now the hotel company did eventually fill the positions, but they had to get really creative about doing it. They went out and sent buses and recruited people on, at community college campuses, and they uh, offered retention bonuses. If you stay for six months, we'll give you a bonus, so they did fill the jobs. But there's another number that's important too, and that number is 900,000. That's the number of open and unfilled positions in the U.S. hospitality industry uh, in the U.S., according to the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Part of the reason for the, the labor shortage is the health and growth of the U.S. hospitality industry, and also the unemployment rate now is at a 48-year low. It was 3.7% uh, in October. Um, a few cities such as New York, oh, and one thing I wanted to say is, um, like when you're, when you're outside of uh, New York, when, you, you know, when you're in the mid Midwest or in the South, and you're talking about non-union hotels, the gig economy is a big competitor as far as uh, you know, filling those jobs. I mean, for, for the wages are so low for some positions, you could drive an Uber and make more money. So a few cities, uh, such as New York City, have adopted the $15 minimum wage. I think that happened in the last few days it started. Um, but it's a much lower in a lot of places. And in fact, the Lodging Association says that 90% of hotels, uh, no, a majority of hotels, pay 90% of their workers at least minimum wage. But when you break that down, that means that a minority of hotels uh, don't pay minimum wage to even 90% um, of the workers. There are, so there are a lot of hotel workers out you know, out in the country that are really making subsistence wages at entry-level jobs. Uh, during the Marriott strike uh, a few months ago, uh, the New York Times did a, a profile of some of the workers who were on strike, um, and it painted a picture of uh, people, you know, making really low salaries, uh, their jobs were being cut um, by outsourcing, and they were really just living paycheck to paycheck. Of course, the labor shortage is not a one-size-fits-all kind of problem. First of all, it affects other industries as well. But the big brands uh, can put a lot more resources uh, towards solving the problem. You know, again, when you go out of, you know, uh, go out into the country uh, for smaller and re regional hotels, uh, it's much more of a problem for them. The Lodging Association does have a number of partnerships in place to train low-skilled workers uh, for hospitality jobs to help them uh, get a foot in the door. So a lot of companies and the association is working on that. Ironically, a potential re recession um, might ease the problem but that's not an outlook that any of us are really uh, rooting for. Uh, one, one outcome that I am rooting for is that Hunter Sampson, my desk mate at Skiff, come ups now, comes up now and does another megatrend. And it worked. Thank you, Padme. <laughs> I'm back. Um, so wellness. Wellness is the new hook in travel marketing. That's our next trend. And there's no denying that wellness is having a moment uh, from the organic and farm-to-table food movements to the rise of clean and natural beauty products to, of course, travel. Wellness is having such a moment that we've launched an entire brand built around it. And if you don't get the newsletter, it's awesome. I love it. I learn something new every week. So, you know, plug, sign up. Uh, the Global Wellness Institute estimates that wellness tourism grew into a $639 billion market in 2017, and that number only stands to rise. And travel marketers have taken note. Uh, where a destination's food opportunities were once a fresh and unique marketing hook, today wellness is being used in campaigns increasingly to woo tourists. Uh, let's talk about Boulder, Colorado as an example. Boulder's been known as one of the centers of the natural movement since the 60s, thanks in no small part to its Rocky Mountain backdrop, easy access to nature, and farm-to-table food scene. It's easy for locals to create a wellness hook. And one tourism official there told us, wellness and health is part of our DNA. If you visit Boulder year-round, it's almost guaranteed you're going to be outside breathing in the fresh air. And since Colorado legalized recreational marijuana, you might breathe in something else while you're there. Uh, but that is a whole other kind of wellness tourism. I think it fits in the category, though. 
Um, to up their wellness marketing game, Boulder's using subtle messaging tactics in its tourism newsletters, and they're not hitting people over the head with it, but it's working. Officials report there that there are more people on Boulder's trails than ever, and as of January of last year, they'd seen a 24% increase in the number of hotel rooms. Um, such as cities going this way, entire regions and countries are promoting uh, the wellness marketing push. Recent Switzerland tourism newsletter promoted certified wellness destinations across the country. We don't see any slides, uh, any signs of this letting up, as you'll see in the next slide. Um, in fact, 2019 could be crucial for wellness, with some estimates predicting the number of travelers making wellness trips could pass the one billion mark. I know, that's a huge, that sounds like a huge number if it sounds suspiciously huge. Um, consider that the bulk of that billion is made up of travelers who are, quote, secondary wellness travelers. So that means they're taking a trip and then they're doing something like moderately healthy, like uh, going for a jog while they're on their trip. But the Global Wellness Institute puts these numbers out, and however you feel about the figures, it's clear that the wellness marketing machine is shifting into high gear. And for our final megatrend, please welcome Jason Clampett, Skift co-founder, to talk about food. Thanks, Hannah. So um, I think the best sign of growth here at Skift is that you... Anybody who's come to a Megatrends event before, you know you have to look at Rafa and I most of the time. And so we did you a favor. Um, you know, we've, we're lucky that we've grown to the point where we've hired people smarter than us. Um, and so I've been lucky that they've been on the stage uh, so much tonight. Um, Another sign of, sign of our growth is uh, the launch of Skiff Table, which we did a year and a half ago. Um, and I've been focused on that the last uh, last year and a half or so. Um, we've got a great newsletter. We've got a forum as well uh, that takes place every September. Um, and this is our second Megatrends package um, this year. So we decided to focus on Google um, because it's big, uh, but also because it's come to almost completely dominate local discovery uh, in the United States. Um, in less than two decades, the battle uh, for local discovery has shifted from a three-pound book filled with yellow pages that sits in the kitchen to a smartphone that can give you access to anything from anywhere. In the 90s, companies including Microsoft Sidewalk, AOL Digital Cities, or City Search duked it out digitally to be the place that people discovered a new restaurant or a bar online, while in print outlets like Zagat or Time Out and local newspapers did the same. Um, there were multiple ways to find a place to go out, both in print and online. Um, I actually worked for three of those places, uh, and um, all three of those are gone. Um, so that's just to demonstrate the change that's taken place over the last two decades. It's not true anymore that, that um, uh, people are discovering uh, places to go and eat um, in mass uh, in a printed guide uh, or uh, on something other than Google. Um, with its trifecta of Google Maps, mobile search, and desktop search, Google fuels local discovery in the United States with a dominance that's daunting. On one of uh, the slides earlier today that Andrew had, uh, you saw the mobile usage habits, the two top things at 90% for maps and 87% for discovering place to eat. Uh, those are things that, can, that are largely done uh, through Google. Sure, there are other ways to find a great taco, Apple Maps exists, Yelp is important enough to worry restaurants, Foursquare hums along quietly in the background, and reservation apps can point the way too. Instagram also has the power to influence um, and inspire, uh, but you can't ask it where to get a burger near you. Of course, in China, where Google is blocked, Baidu and WeChat reign supreme. But, but about Google's dominance, don't take our word for it. Um, back in September at our restaurants forum, Ben Leventhal, the CEO of Resi, uh, said uh, this, I'm opening Google Maps and not anything else. That's the point. The funnel has changed. You used to have open table at the top of the funnel, and now Google is at the top of the funnel. Yelp, if you want 4,000 choices, sure. Um, but on desktop and mobile search, Google offers structured results for searches like Best Burger in New York City that take users to map-based lists that show photos, opening hours, delivery services, and even let you make reservations without even clicking through to the website. Recent partnerships with reservation services like Resi, um, Open Table, and Seven Rooms mean that diners don't even have to leave there to book a table. 
Um, if you don't want to go to, for Google's recommendations, you can find the recommendations of companies with pockets deep enough to show up high in Google search results. For restaurants, there's just one company like that, and that's the Booking Holdings backed Open Table. In the first nine months of 2018, the parent company spent $3.5 billion on digital marketing, the lion's share of which went to Google. Some of that of course, was for their travel products, um, and some was for restaurants. That's why it's easy for OpenTable to be placed high on the page for restaurants that don't even appear on OpenTable. On Google Maps and smartphones, there's now an upgraded Explore tab that automatically suggests highly rated restaurants in your, in your immediate area. It's called the foodie list, uh, even if you're not even searching for a place to eat at the time. There are restaurant apps that offer curated lists, too but it's very expensive to acquire users for those, uh, which is why we saw consolidation in space earlier in this year with Resi buying Reserve. Um, and so, but discovery for others, whether it's an app or a website, is very challenging now. In 2019, Google will likely increase its dominance thanks to smart moves in voice search, where find me great guacamole is a much easier thing to say than book me a flight for a family of four to Cleveland and I don't like middle seats. I'm going to bring up the rest of the group now for a Q&A session. OK, anybody have a question? Hand up. Hi, I wanted to ask you a little bit more um, about labor and not just hospitality labor. Um, there's a lot of jobs out there that aren't based on minimum wage, whether you're running you know, the director of a sales team at a hotel, whether you're a VP of operations um, at a TMC on the corporate side. What are you guys seeing in that space? And heads up, I'm a headhunter, so I have my own opinions. Dennis, you want to Well, I, I think in the hospitality industry, it, it isn't just a matter of uh, minimum wage workers. They are seeing shortages, even for general managers and things like that. So, but I think it's probably more acute uh, at the lower end of the scale. Uh, and yes, this is not just for hospitality. Um, I think there was uh, a regional airline recently that went out of business uh, because they had a pilot shortage. And like in hospitality, um, a lot of these problems are, you know, if you don't pay enough wages, you're not going to get the workers. It's supply and demand. So some of these regional airlines are paying pilots, you know, almost like working in McDonald's type wages. So it, 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 it's definitely not just a... Uh, a um, you know, minimum wage type problem. Yeah, I cover corporate travel and meetings mostly. So what I hear is on the TMC side, you know, it's hard to sell people on the lower end, these sectors as a career, um, particularly in meetings and events, because a lot of the time someone starts off and they love events and they want to run events. And over the course of the next year, they get completely burnt out as more people are being asked to do more work. And if you don't have time to learn and people leave the sector completely. So there's also sort of a training and education problem too that compounds the issue. Questions, please? What's to see in Puerto Rico if you decide to go there? I just came back. 10 days ago from Puerto Rico, my wife and I and son. Your question was, what's there to see in Puerto Rico? What's, how's the recovery like? Is that the question? So the recovery, um, I don't know if anybody from Puerto Rico, tourism company, et cetera, are here. I know they're going to be in some of the other mega trends. But I happen to be a Puerto Rico fanboy, so take it for what it is. Um, our whole company went to Puerto Rico in June last year as part of our annual trip. So I think all of us uh, got to experience it. The recovery um, in San Juan, the main... Uh, capital has been quite fast, but in outside of the main cities, there's still um, you can still see blue tarps in uh, villages and houses. Uh, from a tourism infrastructure perspective, it's already there, I think is is recovered in many different ways. I think what they do need is enough tourists uh, to come and spend time. There's a lot of um, stuff happening. The um, Hamilton is is playing. Uh, I'm only pointing at Hannah because she's the world's biggest fan for Hamilton. Um, and um, it, it started a run this week in Puerto Rico. Last night is that what it was? Last Friday. And so uh, obviously you have a, a hugely high profile uh, show that's there. That's bringing in a lot of tourists um, there as well. Uh, there's a lot of happening in the food scene. 
There's a lot happening on the alternative accommodation scene as well. So I think it's an amazing place to go. There's a, I, I think in general, we, um, the New York Times travel list, we sometimes um, make fun of it once in a while. Uh, but I think they did a really good job picking Puerto Rico as the top place. The person who wrote it wrote a very well, a, a very good profile of what's happening in Puerto Rico and why it's the number one place to go on their list. So I do think I can go on and on about Puerto Rico, but uh, it's a great place to go with kids and so much happening. Other questions? Um, I have a question about wellness. Um, it seems to me that there's a connection between wellness and sustainability. Um, and I was wondering if you had come across anything in your research on wellness um, about how it relates to what's happening in sustainability in tourism and sort of beyond generally in development. Our wellness person is based in Berlin, so <laughs> I'm going to try to channel her. Um, no, I mean, I think that we have seen um, a parallel there, and I think that um, that's a that is a point of pride for a lot of like wellness destinations um you don't I, I, they don't want people coming and feeling like they're like leaving plastic behind and contributing to pollution and everything i think the message of sustainability is really baked into um wellness travel and wellness tourism try not to leave too much of a footprint um leave a place better than it was when you got there that kind of thing um so i'm not sure that we've done uh, a lot of research on that yet, but um, this is an area that we're really diving into more now. So um, we'll be thinking about that as we move forward too, because uh, we're we're really ramping up that coverage. So thanks for that question. I saw like a bunch more hands in the middle, in the middle in the back. Oh, right here. Okay. Hi. Um, my name's Tori Hansen. I actually work at the New York Times, um, although I don't compile the 52 places to go. I run uh, Times Journeys, which is our tour and travel division. Um, you spoke a little bit around um, Google's impact in the restaurant and food um, industry. I would really love to hear any thoughts on the impact on the travel industry, and especially as you're starting to see them playing with the likes of Touring Bird. Um, and maybe that also speaks to one of your other trends around big brands and wielding their power. Okay, okay. Andrew, Sean, Dennis, or Heisha? <laughs> So my take on Google is they have sort of like a bifurcated strategy, right? Like on one hand, they have the maps, the recommendation engine that they're baking into the maps to tell you where to go or help you find a place. On the other hand, they have this huge travel business, but they're making so much money on advertising that they're not yet fully moving into travel selling. So that's, to me, like the top level thing that's happening. It's like, at what point will the money Google could possibly make actually selling travel outweigh its advertising needs, like what it needs to, to sell to make money? And uh, I, don't, I don't know, because they don't talk much. My answer is not anytime soon. Google makes so much money on advertising. You know, there's always a discussion, is Google going to become an online travel agency? No, not, you know, not, not in the near term. Uh, they are making so much money on advertising that um, it would be foolish for them to, you know, totally compete against uh, their biggest advertisers. They are taking over the travel world in terms of uh, meta search. Uh, they're making inroads in hotels and flights. Uh, they're starting with tours and activities, maps. Um, you know, so they are making, they are feared, and they also have sort of a monopoly where they dominate search results and put their, their, own, um, their own products ahead of uh, you know, other travel companies. So they are slowly taking over the world. Yeah, I mean, I would just echo what was just said. And there's also some technical challenges with what Jason had mentioned about in voice search. You know, it's easier to ask about the guacamole versus the complicated flight trip. And at Skift Global Forum, we had the head of product for Google's travel business. Uh, and he said it is, a, it is a technical challenge greater in travel than in restaurants. It's one reason why they're leading with restaurants to try to solve the problem. But advertising, the money speaks first, I think. Another question. I, I was struck by the um, penetration of mobile use in that chart up there that had the mobile uh, experience discovery. It was notably different. It was 35%. What, 
What do you think the impediments are for that percentage going up since especially it seems like there's this trend of the massive all like lemmings going to one place. <laughs> so maybe a little bit more mobile discovery might help even that out. I don't know. So, I mean, there is a discovery issue, but there's also the reality that you start at, if you're a small tour operator, you start because you love hiking or you love skiing. You're not getting into it to delve into online distribution. So what you're seeing, and, and I worked on a, a big feature about this last year, is you're seeing a variety of different companies that are trying to make it easier for tour operators to get online, get onto these platforms, market themselves. Um, it's sort of similar to what happened in hotels 10, 15 years ago with, with Booking.com, where there was this long tail of European hotels that just weren't online. And so they brought them online and they reaped the reward. So I think just more stuff has to come online um, for that to be a reality, and that'll take time. Um, the good news is you have Google, Expedia, Booking sort of fighting over that. TripAdvisor has Viator, which is the biggest online tour seller right now, but it's kind of commodity product. And I think there's some truth to like the bigger issue you're talking about is that in the age of influencers, in the age of being able to find whatever information you want, how many people are really going to buy an experience when they can just go to a place and have an experience? And I, I think that's still an open question. Next question. Hi, what would you say is the biggest or more, most shocking thing that happened between last year and this year? <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> this might not classify as the biggest, most shop, shocking, but as an online travel nerd that I am, uh, Booking.com, which spends billions and billions on digital marketing, decided that they wanted to do more TV and to lean into that. You know, they still do a lot of digital marketing, but they want to really grow their TV advertising. Why? I think they might have, might have gotten a hint from the hotel industry, which has been pushing direct bookings uh, for the last few years. Booking.com does, you know, wants, the peop wants people to come direct to them and not have to go through Google to find them. So they want to build their brand. For me, that was like um, seeing an, an elephant fly. So one of our earlier trends uh, touched on this is I, I think that um, the tech blowback uh, from consumers, the, we want we love all the great things tech can do for us. You know, we're happy to, you know, stick a, a microphone for an advertising company in our house as long as it tells us the weather. Um, but at the same time, there is this pushback uh, uh, about technology and how intrusive it is into our lives. And a lot of people are escaping from that through travel. Um, and so I think we're seeing travel more as a way for people to have deeper experiences. And experience has been a buzzword for ages. Um, but I think that's that will continue to grow in 2019 because of this pushback. Hi. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you all for putting this on. It's really great for those who work in the travel industry to understand how to prepare for our consumers. I have my own site, so for me, it's more about trying to find budget for my consumers that follow me. And have you seen any of those sites like Kayak or Hopper or those kind of like budgetary sites kind of influence any of the trends for this year? Um, and Dennis can think while I, I tap dance. Um, so, so the question is, uh, have, have like uh, companies like Hopper and Kayak, have they done things to help with, I apologize. Yeah, to mainly sites that find them all at one time. So I know Hopper is one, but I use Travel Pirates, which is a pretty, I don't know if you guys know Travel Pirates, but they find all of the budgetary sites and put it all in one place for you. So I don't know if that affects other companies like the major airline companies and the hotel companies that are looking for those same consumers to get that cheaper price before they go to the smaller site, yeah. So, so something that um, Dennis has covered intensively is that the, the price comparison sites do especially well on mobile um, because when you're you know, have that small screen, you don't have, you, 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 you're more likely to want to have a price suggestion to you. You have only a, a, few, a few range. So getting the content for if, if you're, all the travel suppliers and brands here, destinations or representing suppliers, you want to make sure that it's presented in such a way that it'll be imported. To, to go back somewhat relatedly to the question about 
innovations in mobile and tying it into Puerto Rico. We went down to Puerto Rico, we've seen some of the innovations that they're doing there, and one of the things they're trying to do is to get people out of San Juan, they are actively going out to try to help people make their content visual, making sure they're getting active you know, online hours and, and uh, information, get the suppliers to band together. So all the hotel concierges in San Juan, as part of this experiment, they're gonna build this My Puerto Rico app um, and the idea is you can, when a consumer lands, everyone pulls together, all the concierges could help, like, pool to try to encourage people if they need help with tips via chatbots. So I think there's, I haven't quite, I know I haven't quite answered your question, but I think part of it is, it's not just what the major companies do, but the information has to be quality that gets ingested, and I think there's a lot of smaller players right now that are trying to get that uh, smaller long tail of, of data come in. So I don't know if... I want to add, sure. add a little bit of, from a research perspective, from the consumer side. Um, just like uh, now, consumers just like jump around so much. Like uh, you have seen a lot of research already and we have done a lot of surveys. Um, just like uh, for the research, pers from the research perspective, like now people in average probably they search, you know, more than 10 um, websites just to you know, before that's a pre pre booking um, from uh, jumping from uh, different devices, different sites can last up to you know six months. So definitely, I think just means the competition is really high. Um, eventually, you know, who will benefit? Um, still, you know, the jury is still out. But uh, it's good to have all the innovation. That means to push all the bigger companies uh, to innovate and to you know just like. Uh, going to um, benefits, benefits consumers, basically. Any other questions? Hey, guys. Thanks we'll for have five minutes, <laughs> according to Rafa. <laughs> Thanks for putting this on. Um, how about positive social change um, going beyond the pop profit motive and you know contributing to a better world? I'd love to hear what you've been seeing on that front. Diana? Coincidentally, a story um, that I found a while ago, just uh, published um, not too long ago this week, um, about this concept of, of sort of conscious travel. Um, and I think that sort of speaks to what you were, what you were referring to. Um, I know... Everyone talks about experiential travel. I'm really sick of hearing the term experiential travel. Um, but experiential travel sort of morphed into transformative travel, which was sort of like a big buzzword last year, right? Like, and transformative travel was sort of described as travel that like transforms you sort of as a person. Like it, it sort of related more to personal fulfillment. I think the extension of transformative travel is now this concept of more like conscious travel or responsible travel, wherein people realize that it's not just all about me, 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 <laughs> and my personal fulfillment, but that my personal fulfillment also relates to the greater good, the larger community outside. Um, and this is something that a number of luxury hospitality executives that I spoke to uh, most recently at um, ILTM in Cannes uh, mentioned to me. They, it was really interesting how one of them, um, who is uh, the Sixth Census CEO, Neil Jacobs, he told me just you know outright, I, I avoid the, using the word luxury. I don't like using that word. It to me, it sounds like excess. It sounds like we're selfish. It sounds like we don't care about people or our communities. Um, maybe maybe he's right there, but but um, but I think that there is sort of this this like overarching consciousness that we need to be more responsible, that we need to care more about our communities. It sort of also ties into the desire for people to sort of market more under tourism, right, to combat over tourism. I think you're seeing those threads sort of intersect. Um, but again, it's, you know, we're still a society of like haves and have nots and travel, while it has been really democratized in so many ways over the past few years, and we've seen the number of people traveling worldwide going up every year over year, um, you know, it's still something for, for brands to consider and, and for individual travelers to consider. Just to put a period on the end of that sentence, um, I cover cruise and uh, one of the biggest, the biggest cruise company in the world, Carnival, um, started a kind of an, an impact cruise line called Fathom. And the idea was that it would go to a couple of different destinations and people would volunteer. It was like a voluntourism cruise line and it did not work. Nobody wanted to do that. Um, you know, it, it's just not the thing that a cruiser wants to do. But um, 
I have heard that since the hurricanes in the Caribbean in 17, um, more cruise lines are getting requests for a volunteer type activity when they go into a port. So maybe there's an appetite for four hours, but there does not appear to be an appetite for seven days of that goodness. <laughs> um, I think we're probably out of time. One more question, one more question. Who, who okay. So what added to this? How many millennials are there in the room? <laughs> so a uh, lot of research out there just talking about millennials are more responsible. They like to identify with the brands that uh, you know speak to their identities. Uh, that happens in travel. Also, I think for companies who are showing that they are they care about their brands, they care about their social responsibilities, environments, they're going to stand out. Uh, just from the research we see. One more question. Oh, hi, my name is Julie. I work for a travel marketing agency. Um, my question, I don't know if this falls under wellness, but do you guys see any trends or future trends for medical tourism? Because um, some destinations offer very good um, you know, opportunities for, especially as our generations are getting older and older, for um, housing for elders or uh, just cheaper services elsewhere? I, I would say yes, because um, covering meetings and events, so many destinations are now talking about becoming a haven for medical tourism. You're also seeing it come from the other side, like you're seeing Uber and Lyft try to become platforms for enabling people to get around um, to medical things. And it's not something, honestly, we've tracked that heavily, but I guess we're going to have to look into it. Or I think right, like Rand Paul is going to Canada to get some medical attention. So, you know, it, it is a trend even among U.S. elected officials or former ones. Um, but also, I think this is a global thing that we're seeing. I know that um, countries in Asia are marketing to Chinese travelers pretty heavily. Um, you know, I, I know people who go to the Caribbean for certain things. People go to Mexico to get their dental work done. So I think it's it exists and it's growing and I'm not sure that it is being like so heavily marketed yet, but I think that there's probably a, a big opportunity for that. I think now we are officially out of time. Um, here's Rafa. Thank you everyone. Thank you for listening for this uh, last hour. Um, I want to thank Hyatt and all of our sponsors again and hope to see you out there. Am I missing anything? Nothing? Okay. All right. Thank you everyone. <laughs> We've already held some of our Mega Trends events, but there are more coming up in places like Dublin, Dubai, Miami, and San Francisco through February 12th. Find out where and whether there's still room at skift.com slash megatrends dash events. And there are even more live events coming up. We're holding Skift Forum Europe on April 30th in London. Find out about this and our other upcoming forums at forum.skift.com. This show was produced by Ben Glowey, who can be found on Twitter at visible underscore sound. Assistant editor Sarah Enlow provided additional support. To subscribe to this podcast, search for Skift on iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please leave a rating and a comment to help other listeners find us. Past episodes and a link to subscribe are online at podcast.skift.com. And this has been the Skift Podcast. Thanks for listening.